before we start, have you guys both watched this? Yes. yes. Right, good. Or not good. I'll, let's not see. Good. Um, as much as I have any awareness of movie production schedules these days, I only became aware of the rhythm section when the trailer popped up on the IMDb app. Coming across somewhere between a European spy caper and a female-led taken, my curiosity was immediately piqued at the notion of Blake Lively going from suburban family every girl to ruthless assassin in search of a vengeance, in search of a vengeance, in search of vengeance for her family who have been killed in a transatlantic plane bombing. Lively is one of those actors who I can imagine doing something really fantastic given the right opportunity, a notion I somehow managed to take away from 2016's bonkers shark debacle, The Shallows. <laughs> and director Reed Morano was a complete enigma. A number of podcasts to which I subscribe were now talking about her with interest as a known quantity, but I'm ashamed to say she was absolutely absent from my radar. As protagonist Stephanie Patrick, Lively starts the movie an unknown quantity herself. Backstory being served as a series of silent, lingering daydream vignettes of middle-class family life where everyone alternates between jovial hugging and lingering smiles to camera. This is momentarily juxtaposed with Stephanie's haggard current existence as a sex worker in a setting immediately interrupted by the arrival of a journalist who drops the bombshell regarding the fate of her family, something which up until now has been deemed a tragic accident. Disappointingly, this is all the personal exposition we can expect, which is really unfortunate as it somewhat undermines Stephanie's subsequent journey into her own personal heart of darkness. There's a lot to be said for economy of storytelling, but if your movie intends to pivot emotionally on my empathy towards an average Joe falling foul of exceptional circumstance, I feel I'm entitled to get to know them at least a little before they transition to a ruthless killer, lest I ultimately know them only as a ruthless killer. I expect empathy is being demanded of me by the sex worker setup, but with no time spent on understanding how harrowing that might be or how far from her upbringing this leaves Stephanie, I can only judge it to be lazy writing and or a cheap attempt at emotional blackmail, neither of which I appreciate. When her journalist contact immediately ends up dead, Stephanie heads from London to the Scottish Highlands to meet with his inside man, disgraced former MI6 agent Ian Boyd. A performance by Jude Law that's not so much phoning it in as allowing the call to go to voicemail. <laughs> For reasons known only to himself, rather than send Stephanie packing, Ian affords her some opportunity to impress him through a Rocky-esque physical training regime, sadly not in montage, and is won over by her determination. Naturally, having demonstrated she can swim across a loch, Ian immediately progresses Stephanie to the stage of training known as Assume the identity of a presumably deceased female assassin and ingratiate yourself to professional agents of international espionage, travelling Europe mercilessly executing those involved in a plot to blow up your family's plane without anyone cottoning on to the fact that you're spectacularly out of your depth. Thank goodness for Sterling K. Brown then, who pops up as former CIA agent Mark Serra, with whom Stephanie builds a professional and ultimately physical relationship, because he at least manages to infuse his own woefully underwritten character with an aura of shadiness and duplicity that is absolutely absent from the script. Without his presence, I might actually have gone off to load the dishwasher and conduct other such <laughs> low-level household chores, rather than keep forcing my eyelids open in service of Stephanie's quest. Despite all the talk of Morano's skill in evidence throughout her previous directorial work, including The Handmaid's Tale and other high-profile TV projects, I find myself unable to build much anticipation for whatever her next cinematic outing might be, which is a shame as I have a shocking lack of knowledge when it comes to female directors and I would desperately like to rectify that. What initially piqued my interest in Morano was her background as a cinematographer, a role that she has previously doubled up on in other directorial projects. Here, however, that duty falls to Sean Bobbitt, another name I drew a blank on until I read his CV and realised he's done some very high-profile stuff. Unfortunately, I don't think this is going to be high up on that list beside the likes of 12 Years a Slave, as somehow the visual aesthetic of varied European cities and the Scottish Highlands, one of the most contrastingly stark and appealing landscapes in the world, hey, we're biased, somehow came across as mostly muddied and indistinct. A little digging into shooting locations perhaps highlights why the Scottish landscapes and London street scenes appear to have been shot in Ireland, no disrespect Ireland, with everywhere else in Europe covered by Madrid. Still, it feels like the film could, with a little more effort and input, have been at least made more visually dynamic. 
In case you hadn't gathered, I don't think there's much to enjoy here, a fact borne out by the complete lack of any desire on my part to structure this review in much of a coherent way. <laughs> Perhaps worst of all, for a film so bereft of detail, having given the rhythm section the time of day despite myself, the ending left me confused, and I don't know if that's because it was poorly written or I momentarily lost concentration at the key moment. Either way, I don't really feel that's my fault, and I certainly didn't feel compelled to skip back and recap what I might have missed. Avoid. Yes, um... I didn't lose concentration much as I wanted to, Craig, so that only leaves you one option as to the ending. <laughs> so Were you similarly confused as to how she made up her mind about who the true culprit was, Drew? Um, I watched this five days ago and I can't remember the ending. <laughs> mm. um, it's... I actually... Um, I kind of thought that was coming, but then I, I thought that... I actually expected something better of this film and that I thought it would be, in a way, worse in that I suspected that she would do that, realise she'd actually be the mistake and the big mastermind was the other fella. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, that is what I was expecting. I was expecting that. Um, and I'm kind of disappointed that didn't happen because, like, well, that would be extra stupid and that'll, that'll fit the film nicely. It, um, it would fit the film nicely because it would explain why an absolute nobody was... You know, uh, you could imagine that in that circumstance, having an absolute nobody be a patsy to clean up the mess left behind would make sense from a plot point of view. Yes. Well, you've made uh, you've mentioned two very important words there, Craig, which is really my biggest issue with the whole film. Explain why. <laughs> I would like this film to explain why anything. <laughs> the the explosion of the plane was passed off as an accident instead of a a uh, terrorist event, please explain why. <laughs> then the, um, is it Raza Jaffrey? I forgot his name. The journalist. Journalist, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Raza Jaffrey. So I wasn't sure if he said his first name. Yeah, yeah, yeah so no, I couldn't tell his name, but he was immediately familiar. Yeah, I've seen him in spooks and stuff. I think yeah. I know him. Um, yeah, Raza Jaffrey. He comes to Blake Lively to tell her about the fact that this was actually a cover up. Please explain why. And then she goes up to uh, see Jude Law up in the Highlands and then he locks in a room for her to go through cold turkey for a bit. Then when he comes out, suddenly he's tracing her to be an assassin. Please, explain why. Because <laughs> <laughs> these things just happen, right? Then, and there is no explanation. It's like, no. well, oh, suddenly he's training her, but there, there's been no discussion of anything, and she's just going along with it. It's just happening, and then suddenly it's months later. And he's shown no desire to do it, but somehow it's as if he's he's grudgingly, it's as if he's being ordered to do it or forced to do it somehow. He could just yeah. tell her to go away. Well, and a then, film needs to occur. I suppose I'd better do it. <laughs> <laughs> and then not I've, on got, a, I've got, got a paycheck I've taken. <laughs> not on her first attempt to tip, but her second one, where she's she once again isn't actually any good at this. Um, and rather than it being, uh, like, suggesting that she's got any real difficulty with it, it's more just like, I think she's just incompetent. <laughs> and she's not, like, working up herself up to have to do this thing. But uh, the second one, which she fails to do, then Jude Law's there and does it anyway. And, like, well, if he was there all along, knew what was happening, knew where she was going, why didn't he just do it? Please explain why mm-hmm. he didn't. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, so... Th- I don't understand a single character's motivation in any of this film and it's just so dreary uh, and I don't see I mean actually I, I perked up a little bit when the opening credits came up because it said produced by Barbara Broccoli and Michael G. Wilson I thought mm-hmm. oh that's quite interesting you don't oh. see those names outside of Bond very often yeah I was going to say for a spy movie this sounds uh, yeah there was a wee bit of promise here and then uh, then it just moves on it's like, and quite quickly uh, oh Oh, oh dear. Right. Um, and I don't, it's weird, Craig, I think when we were discussing covering this film last week, I was, I was absolutely certain I knew Reed Morano. I'm like, mm-hmm. nope, I've never seen a thing she's done. I don't know where that idea came from. Maybe mm-hmm. I've heard her name a lot or something, but yeah, I'm not seeing where there's great promises coming from from her. Um, I, well, this is the thing is that I, I became convinced that I must be familiar with some of her work purely by the terms in which other people just started talking about her as a known quantity yeah, and like the quality of her work. And I'm like, oh, right. Okay. Yeah. I'm, this must be someone I've heard of before. And I've just put her, I've just, you know, Put, put her out of my mind or for you know whatever reason and then I realized nope not seen a not seen a single thing and prior to this I don't think I've heard any of these same people talking about her so I don't know yeah um 
Blake Lively is largely an unknown to me. I think the only thing I've ever seen Blake Lively in was The Town mm. uh, with Ben Affleck. And I remember being passable in that, but I, mean, I have no yeah. opinion of it. You know what? To be fair to her, she's okay in this. She's, yeah. uh, why she's cast as an English person, I don't know. But I don't know either, but her, her accent is passable, Drew. Yeah, I was pretty impressed with her accent, mm. although perhaps not to the extent I've seen with some other actors, but I do feel she's a bit constrained in terms of emotion by having to do the accent. I've seen that before. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, as I say, I've seen it worse, but um, some of her line of it was a bit odd, a bit flat perhaps. Mm. Uh, but I, I mean, I suppose she does well enough, but there's a character's completely underwritten as is the character of every character in the film. Mm. It's just a complete nothing of a film. And it's just so dreary and boring. And it really... Ought to have been better, but when like one of the highlights of your action set pieces is a woman failing to overcome a man in a wheelchair who can't see. <laughs> you know, it's, I'm not that impressed. <laughs> and who was catatonic to begin with? Yep. <laughs> this this whole assassin gig isn't panning out the way I expected it to. <laughs> yeah, it's it's just a it's just a bad film. Um, hmm. and honestly I don't know where the the big problems lie it's just, it doesn't have any visual flair, it doesn't seem to have any editorial or directing flair yeah. but, and the acting from Blake Lively, she's probably the best thing I've heard because her mm-hmm. acting is solid she's just in a terrible film with a bad script mm-hmm. um, Sterling K. Brown uh, I, mean, I guess he had some charisma, which is what the film was solely lacking, so mm-hmm. that's okay yeah, Jude Law <laughs> You, you described it well, Craig. I won't bother saying anything more about that. Um, yeah, it's just a complete blank of a film. It's a shame. I think with the exception of Lively and Sterling K. Brown, it's just as if everyone involved was just trying, it just felt like they were just trying to get this over and done with. Mm. Like as if they were acknowledging the fact that, because I believe it's based on a novel. Um, and yeah. it's, it seems like the kind of novel that would be like a, a, you know, a beach read on a holiday or something. You know, you read on the, the flight to Alicante or something like that. Yeah. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. And it, you know, and it would make for, you know, potentially the, the trailer. I think the problem for me is I built up the expectation because the trailer really emphasized the sort of down and sort of dirty or what what it kind of made out this was going to be a sort of like low down kind of dirty. B movie kind of like spy thing and I'm really down with that mm. and especially with the notion of a of a female director behind the lens because not to be like super woke but this is this you know more than most other genres I think just the, the spy genre name, name me another film that's been directed by a uh, you know a spy movie that's been directed by a woman there, is there might Dark be people. Thirty Count is a spy film. No, sort see, I don't. Is. I don't know that it does. I mean, it might do. It might do because immediately I'm thinking of. Uh, I'm think. I was going to say action movies, and then I thought, all right, okay, I can't. I can't say that because of the person you're thinking of. But I don't think you know a spy thriller. I don't. I can't think of. There's a genre that man. Listen, I will take all the female perspective I can get on that if you want to give me some quality material. Yeah, just nobody involved really seems all that interested, yeah. and I don't know why. I don't know if this is, the, is it just a case that Reed Morano was told like, okay, I know you've got some projects that you'd like to work on. Uh, you know, if you want us to fund X movie, then we really need you to make this pot boiler for us. Just go out and make this thing and then we'll let you do the thing you want to do. I don't, I just get the impression it might be something along those lines, but the reception to this has been so bad and the box office has been like record poor. I think it's one of the, the one of the lowest box office openings on record for a for a movie that hit so many uh, screens uh, on its opening in the US. A tenth of its budget. Yeah, it's like um, you know, and it doesn't have a huge budget to begin with. That you can't help but think that this might be one of those where she's you know she's she's made a deal with the devil, uh, but now th- the devil's not going to let her let her make <laughs> make the things she wanted to make anyway. Yeah. It's just really bizarre. Yeah, and the, to go back to the trailer, I think this may be the last trailer I actually saw in the cinemas before they all got shot. Um, yeah. I, I really liked that trailer. I thought that trailer was really good. I would yeah, like the, the person who was involved in creating and editing that trailer to be yeah. involved with actually doing the, the creating yeah. editing of the film. Uh, yeah, but so sadly, that is not the case. Let's have no more of these misleading trailers. But yes, the trailer <laughs> editing was good. Um, yeah, it was a trailer uh, for a great movie. Yeah. Uh, just before we move on to... Uh, Scott's opinion on this. Can I just ask a question? Because it's 
a, an irritation of a film has just come back to me and mm-hmm. given that it's about the rhythm section i can't mm-hmm. believe i forgot about it because the film's called as you may have noticed the rhythm section mm-hmm. and it starts off with suggesting that bits of your body are parts of an orchestra or something mm-hmm. and it does the same thing twice mm-hmm. did i miss it or did i never actually get to which part of your body is the rhythm section so like one part of you is the percussion, one part is the bass, and then I don't think it ever actually you, mentioned the rhythm section. The heart is the whatever, and your breathing is the bass, I think, or the yeah, other way around. Heart is percussion then, and breathing is bass. Oh yes, yeah. or the other way around. But and then did that twice, and it was mm-hmm. like um, in Lauren service of a title that it was basically a title looking for a for a novel. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, it yeah, makes no I sense. Never actually to anything. mentioned the the title in it. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so I didn't just miss it; it's just not there. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, thank yes. you. <laughs> it's the the thing that annoyed me, and I, I purposely avoided putting this actually in the text of my review that I've just read to everybody, um, because it kind of annoyed me so much. And um, at the point at which they wheel that out, I'm like, oh my god, this is so laboured and just false, and it's so so forced this whole thing, and then it's never followed up on. Um, and not only that, but it's in service of right, okay, you're learning to shoot. If you want to actually kill somebody with a gun, you need to be composed, you need to do this, you need to think of it. I'm like, right, if I can get behind this, and if you're going to make something of it thematically, that would make sense. How many people does she kill with a gun in this movie? Two. Is it even that? (laughs) Uh, There is one, but I'm not sure if it's many more than that. Not a lot of people get shot in this film. No. No. um, Not a lot of people die in this film, in fact. Nope. Nope. Um, and not that I'm hankering for people to be murdered, but it kind of begs, the, you're, you're quite right to bring it up, Drew, because it kind of begs the question, right, what was that whole thing about? You know the thing you've named the movie after? <laughs> was the point of that again? Oh, there wasn't one. Yeah, it's just a clever title. Somebody yeah. thought it was a clever title. I'm not even going to add anything. Uh, I, As I say, I watched this five days ago. I barely remember it. Um, it has occupied so little room in my brain that even though I knew I was watching it to talk about it in a podcast I couldn't be bothered to remember anything that happened in it so uh, that pretty much is the impact that it had on me uh, can I just can I just say Scott picture me this morning trying to write that stuff out having watched it the best part of three weeks ago <laughs> this is you know what the, the the bad or the worst thing about this is is that man I want nothing more than a sort of really dirty spy thriller espionage movie with a female lead and a female director because there's a whole perspective that i haven't got on anything yet and that i think we could really inject something interesting into a genre and the biggest my biggest worry off the back of this is that no studio is going to turn around and hand this kind of movie to a female lead and a female director again anytime soon yeah yeah and that's a real shame yes uh, so 